Welcome to our webinar on lung volume reduction in emphysema. I'm Dr. Richard Barrowcliffe. I'm one of the chest physicians here at Woodenshaw Hospital. And I've been leading and developing the lung volume reduction service here in Manchester, probably for the last four or five years now. We've got quite a distinguished faculty this evening. Uh, Professor Vespo, who many of you will know, is going to talk to us a little bit about non-pharmacological interventions for breathlessness in COPD. And then it's the rest of the lung volume reduction team that are going to present. So I'm going to talk a little bit about who benefits from lung volume reduction. Rebecca Durden is going to give us some imaging tips, um, imaging essentials, tips and tricks in lung volume reduction patients. We're then going to hear about the patient and their experience, which obviously is the most important part of all of this and, and how they've benefited from endobronchial valve therapy. And then we'll have a brief overview from our surgical colleagues about the surgical lung volume reduction program that we run in Manchester. So with no further ado, I think we'll move on to our first talk and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Jürgen Vespo. I'm, as I say, many of you will know Jürgen. He, he's internationally renowned, world famous, leading COPD physician. He's based between here and here in Manchester and Copenhagen, although he spent the majority, if not all of the last year in Copenhagen because of the travel restrictions imposed by COVID. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope you can see the screen now for this kind introduction. I am actually also a chest physician at Withenshaw Hospital without being a professor. It's my pleasure to introduce slightly this talk about uh, non-pharmacological interventions for breathlessness. Um, and very briefly, I have a few disclosures of interest and I don't think they will affect my talk much. The thing about breathlessness in COPD in general is that of course, uh, breathlessness is the hallmark uh, of all uh, diseases with airflow limitation. But with emphysema, we have the added effect of the loss of elastic recoil leading to static dynamic hyperinflation and increased work of breathing. And of course, on top of that, you also have the reduced gas exchange. So breathlessness is really the thing that matters in emphysema. But I think you cannot stress too much that in emphysema, as in other types of COPD, deconditioning plays a major role for the breathlessness that our patients experience. And also very often they have frequent comorbidities. Emphysema could be part of multimorbidity and especially things like heart failure can add significantly to the breathlessness of the patients. And we should not forget that, although tonight we'll be very much focused on uh, the lungs. Now, if we go to the pharmacological treatment very quickly, this is from the Global Initiative on Obstructive Lung Diseases. Basically, uh, any patients with COPD, you can start on um, a bronchodilator. So it could be a long-acting beta agonist or and it is quite simple. You then give the combination of two. You consider switching inhaler device or the molecules in the combination device. And of course, you all the time wonder, could there be other causes of dyspnea? Now, if patients are on ICS containing regimens and you're only treating breathlessness, this is also the time where you consider stopping that. If you look at the NICE guidance on treating breathlessness in COPD, it's even simpler. You start with a short acting beta agonist. And if that is not sufficient, and it rarely is, you go straight to a combined long acting beta agonist and long acting anticholinergic. Now, the Manchester guidance for managing COPD has not taken this on board. We still think you can start with one long acting bronchodilator. The reason NICE has done this is that it does not really add much cost. It's much more simple, and basically there are no added side effects. If we then look at uh, non-pharmacological treatment of breathlessness, there is the one for everybody and then one for not quite so many. The one for everybody is, of course, pulmonary rehabilitation. There's a load of evidence that pulmonary rehabilitation improves breathlessness, it improves health status, quality of life, that is, and it improves exercise tolerance in stable patients with COPD, including emphysema patients. And for those of you who've not been to a rehabilitation class, I think you really should go. There is the added benefit of going to pulmonary rehabilitation that you meet other patients. And you would always think that you would be the one who was the only one feeling as bad as you do. When you go to a pulmonary rehabilitation class with 10 people, there'll always be nine who can spot one who's worse off than themselves. And we probably shouldn't neglect that. Often there are some 
um, things done in common, some warm up, and you can see the guy in the middle is number 10, who's already exhausted during warm up, but otherwise patients train on their own. This is a treatment that is to do and it works. I usually say this is one of the patients on the way home from pulmonary rehabilitation class doing extremely well, although perhaps slightly exaggerated. But the topic for today is the thing that may not uh, benefit everybody, but can benefit a subgroup tremendously. And that is what we sort of put under the umbrella term of endobronchial, where it clearly states that in select um, do improve uh, exercise tolerance, health status and lung function in uh, at least in trials up to a year following treatment. And as you can see, the evidence is better for endobronchial valves than for both coils and vapor ablation. Going to the endobronchial valves, there's very good evidence for reduced breathlessness and improved exercise tolerance. The thing that we're going to discuss tonight and we're we're definitely going to get some tips from Rebecca also is, and it depends on absence of collateral ventilation. And that's a crucial thing. And I'm sure that will be addressed several times. Um, what has been seen as perhaps slightly scary, but actually should not be, is that the procedure is in most studies associated with an approximately 25% risk of pneumothorax, uh, which is actually a very good indicator of successful target low occlusion um, and most patients who have subsequently experienced the benefit of the pneumothorax. There are other risks associated with the procedure. There's the risk of valve removal, valve replacement, and also in patients, particularly if they're not selected properly, there is a risk of exacerbations of COD following uh, the endobronchial valve placement. The other procedures are much less well validated. The thing about long coils and vapor ablation is that it's not dependent on intact fissure or absence of collateral ventilation, but the results are less and they're also less impressive. And both procedures are associated with exacerbation and a higher risk of pneumonia. So I think we're in a good place tonight to discuss non-pharmacological interventions and just remember that uh, it comes into a group of interventions for breathlessness that for everybody should involve pulmonary rehabilitation. It should involve proper bronchodilatation, which in most patients, particularly the ones we discuss tonight, will mean dual bronchodilatation. Then we will discuss the endobronchial valves. But I urge you, please do remember the comorbidities. Treatment of comorbidities can be as important for management of breathlessness as actually doing endobronchial valves or any other of the other above. So I'll end here. Thank you for your attention. And I will, as most of you, I hope, look forward to the rest of the evening. Thanks, Jürgen. That, that was really good. Thank you very much. So the next talk is myself talking about who benefits from lung volume reduction. Lung volume reduction. Who benefits? When we're thinking about lung volume reduction treatments, these are specifically targeted towards patients with emphysema and hyperinflation. Emphysema is defined by abnormal and permanent enlargement of the airspaces distal to the terminal bronchioles. It is associated with destruction of the alveolar tissue and alveolar walls. This causes reduced gas transfer, loss of elastic recoil leading to early airway closure during expiration and gas trapping in the distal airspaces. This is shown graphically on this slide. On the left, we can see normal alveoli with gas exchange occurring across a large surface area. On the right, there's enlargement of the air spaces and breakdown of the alveolar walls, as well as associated small airways obstruction. This can be seen here on this lateral chest X-ray. The one on the right is normal. The patient on the left, on the left has emphysema with hyperinflation. There are increased lung volumes and the diaphragm has been depressed and flattened. This increased volume puts the muscles at a mechanical disadvantage, increasing the work of breathing and causing breathlessness. So hyperinflation leads to chronic dyspnea, limited exercise tolerance and poor quality of life. It's also been linked to mortality though, and here we can see a reduced survival rate 
in the group of patients with hyperinflation as evidenced by a reduced inspiratory capacity to total lung capacity ratio. This slide shows the hyperinflation in a different way. In emphysema, the air trapping occurs in the most diseased part of the lung, i.e. the most emphysematous. This contributes little to gas exchange and can be considered non-functional. The aim of lung volume reduction is to remove or decrease this lung tissue, making room for the non-diseased lung to expand into, whilst reducing the overall lung volume. Lung volume reduction surgery is a well-established treatment that has been shown to improve symptoms and survival in selected COPD patients with emphysema. Essentially, it's a non-anatomical wedge resection of the most severely diseased area of the lung. There's been one large randomized controlled trial with long-term follow-up, a net trial, and two smaller studies. These have shown improvements in quality of life, exercise capacity, and lung function in selected patients. This has come at a cost of a significant risk of complications and early mortality. The long-term survival appears to be improved. This is data taken from the NET trial. The overall response rate in the surgical group was 15%, compared with 3% in the non-surgical group. This is in terms of improvements of symptoms. It's possible to identify a group of patients that do very badly with lung volume reduction surgery and have an increased early mortality rate. These are defined by the presence of both an FEV1, less than 20% of predicted, and either homogenous emphysema or a gas transfer less than 20% of predicted. We can also identify a group that do particularly well, who appear to have a definite mortality benefit. These are patients with upper lower predominant disease and a low baseline exercise tolerance. In this group with the good outcomes, there's approximately a 30% response rate in terms of symptoms. Because of the significant morbidity risk associated with surgery, other techniques of lung volume reduction have been developed. Endobronchial valve therapy is the most developed of these and involves the insertion of one-way valves into the airways. The treatment is targeted at the lobar level and the valves allow air and mucus to exit the lobe during exhalation, but they block air entry during inspiration. Here we can see a picture on the right showing one of the Zephyr valves in situ. The valves in the open position indicating that this picture has been taken in exhalation. If the patient was breathing in, the valve would be closed. The valves are placed bronchoscopically under conscious sedation or a light general anaesthetic. There have been several randomized controlled trials looking at endobronchial valves using the Zephyr valve from pulmonics. There's good evidence to show benefit in terms of lung function, exercise capacity, and quality of life. The greatest benefits are seen in patients with heterogeneous emphysema, but there are also significant improvements seen in patients with homogeneous emphysema. There are two types of valves available at the moment in the UK, the Zephyr valves, which I've mentioned, and also spiration valves, which are an umbrella type of valve. As mentioned, endobronchial valves work best when targeted at a low bar level. They are not effective if there is evidence of collateral ventilation. This occurs when there are communications between lobes in the lungs. This can occur naturally or as part of the lung destruction that occurs as emphysema advances. The presence of collateral ventilation means that air is still able to enter the target lobe, even if the main airways are occluded by valves. The presence of collateral ventilation can be determined in a number of ways. The first is review of the CT scan by an expert radiologist who is experienced in assessing these cases. Secondly, there are a number of computer programs that will analyze the CT scan for us. We use a program called Stratex, which will give us an emphysema score for the different lobes, as well as a measure of lung volume, and also give us a figure for the integrity of the interlobar fissures. Finally, we can carry out an endobronchoscopic procedure called Chartis, where we make direct measurements to assess for the presence of collateral ventilation. 
This is outcome data from some of the Zephyr valve trials. As you can see, the improvements are fairly consistent across the different trials, suggesting that this is a real effect. NHS England has recently announced plans to fund lung volume reduction treatments and commission treatment centres. They've specified a number of criteria for commission services. Patients must undergo assessment by a lung volume reduction MDT to determine the most appropriate intervention. The MDT must include a surgeon, a COPD physician, an interventional bronchoscopist, a radiologist and a specialist nurse. NHS England have specified a number of referral criteria. Patients need to be breathless and have an MRC score greater than or equal to three. They must have not smoked for at least four months. They must have completed pulmonary rehabilitation within 12 months or be taking part in an ongoing post-PR program. They need a reasonable level of fitness, so they need to complete 140 metres on a six-minute walk test or 80 metres on a shuttle test. FEV1 should be between 15 and 50% of predicted, and gas transfer should be over 20% of predicted. To be referred to the MDT, they need a residual volume greater than 150% of predicted. This should be measured by plethysmography, ideally. You can measure lung volumes using gas washout methods, but this tends to underestimate lung volumes in patients with severe airflow obstruction. Patients who are clearly not suitable for lung volume reduction are those with severe comorbidities, such as renal, hepatic or cardiac failure, and those with other chronic respiratory diseases, such as pulmonary fibrosis. Progressive malignancy and severe pulmonary hypertension would also exclude patients from consideration for this therapy. The MDT may feel that patients are not suitable for treatment for a number of reasons, including an inability to identify a suitable target area, excessive risk, for instance, with a high Glenfield score, presence of significant comorbidity or bronchiectasis with a high sputum load. In order to meet the criteria for endobronchial valve therapy, patients need to have upper or lower lower predominant heterogeneous emphysema without collateral ventilation. They need to have a residual volume greater than 180% of predicted, and a gas transfer greater than 20% of predicted. In order to be eligible for lung volume reduction surgery, patients need to have evidence of heterogeneous emphysema. This can be either predominantly upper lobe or lower lobe. In addition, they must have signs of hyperinflation, including a residual volume greater than 150% of predicted, a residual volume to TLC ratio greater than 60, as well as a gas transfer greater than 20% of predicted, and a BMI greater than 18. So in summary, lung volume reduction is an effective treatment for selected patients. Patients need to have a diagnosis of emphysema with evidence of hyperinflation. This equates to a residual volume greater than 150% of predicted by plethysmography for surgery and greater than 180% of predicted for endobronchial valve therapy. All cases must be reviewed by a specialist MDT in order to determine the optimal treatment plan. Thank you. And so the next talk is Rebecca Durden, who's going to give us a talk on imaging essentials, tips and tricks in LVR patients. Good evening. My name is Rebecca Durden, and I want to thank you for inviting me to present today. I'm a chest radiologist working here at Withenshaw within the Emphysema MDT. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, the kind of imaging essentials that you need in order to be able to evaluate people um, coming for lung volume reduction. So the first thing to say is we need to know when to image the patients for lung volume reduction, both for initial diagnosis of emphysema or COPD, with potential case selection, what algorithms we need to use for that, how we do pre-procedural analysis, including both visual and computer-aided evaluations, and also how we can do post-treatment problem solving using imaging. So the first thing we need to talk about is what's available um, for most patients coming in with potential um, uh, emphysema needing lung volume reduction. We've got the options of chest x-rays, which are cheap, quick and low dose, 
well, they're not particularly sensitive unless you have severe disease. Um, and also it's not specific for causes of air trapping, such as airway pre uh, predominant pathologies within the COPD phenotype spectrum, which might be better for medical management. And, and also reporting is reported dependent. Not everybody has a large amount of some specialty training within um, thoracic radiology to be able to identify those patients as well as looking for complications and related pathologies such as lung cancer. Compare that with CT, which is relatively expensive um, and with limited primary care access, certainly, and carries a high dose of the patient. However, it is much more sensitive looking for emphysema, particularly in mild to moderate disease. And it's much more specific for looking for complications and associated pathology. And again, the ability to evaluate it at uh, the MDT level is limited to those thoracic radiologists who are involved on a regular basis, which there are not many in the country. So what can we do? We can uh, compare a chest x-ray to the CT with these coronary formats. And here you can see that we've got on the left, we've got a CT with cigarette smoking related emphysema. So this is central lobby emphysema, little holes in the lung, which is predominant in the upper zones with a little bit of disease in the mid zones and relative rate of sparing. Compare that to this patient who's been a cannabis smoker, there's a large area of massive destruction in the APCs with much more normal appearing lower lobes. And this is distribution is quite typical for cannabis use. However, if you look at this patient who has been a smoker, they've also got a genetic predisposition for emphysema with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And you've got large areas of panas for emphysema and bolus change in the upper lobes, as well as paraceptal emphysema in the lower lobes and basal emphysema as well, and that distribution is more typical with alpha-1 antitrypsin anti deficiencies. So by looking at the distribution, we can often work out why the patient has got emphysema and other phenotypes of COPD. So when do we image in the patients who are potentially lung volume reduction? We really do need clinical evidence that they have COPD and that their lung function parameters suggest that intervention would be of use. So the RV needs to be large enough to warrant treatment. They have to have physiological severe air trapping. Um, and really, we want an engaged patient who stopped or stopped smoking. We also really wouldn't repeat a CT if they've had a recent one that's of good enough quality to evaluate. Um, we do want to make sure that it's a sequential CT, which I'll come on to uh, is shortly and not more than 12 months old, partly because we want to check there's no new abnormality that would start treatment as well as make sure there's no progression. So if that's present, we would then use a dedicated CT protocol. And that CT protocol needs to make sure we get all the information we have. So we would make sure that it's the same on every scanner in the hospital. We want to make sure we've got thin, high resolution slices that produce a volume so we can look at in multiple planes, old-fashioned sequential HRCT slices are useful, but they're not ideal for modern evaluation. We need soft tissue and lung formats, and that's because it's difficult to see soft tissue lesions and lymph nodes if we've not got soft tissue formats, um, because we've not got contrast on board. We want expiratory slices to look for air trapping, because that's important to evaluate for the airways predominant COPD phenotypes. They might be better with medical management. And also we want the thin coronal and sagittal reformats to allow to look for visual integrity assessment, which is a large part of what we do in the CPTT. So this is the protocol we have on our scanner. You can see it's labeled a FSEMA LVR and it's got a very specific setup so the radiographers can click and do the same for each patient. So when we're looking at potential case selection within MDT, there are five areas that I look at. I look at heterogeneity within the emphysema, so you can see here, the left upper lobe has lost nearly all of its normal architecture. And if you look at the reformats, coronal and sagittal reformats, you can see this huge swathes of destroyed left upper lobe. There are very small amount of residual tissue left in the vincula. So this would be a left upper lobe target. However, we need to make sure if we're using endovocular valve therapy that there is visual integrity between the lobes to allow the valves to collapse the effective target lobe. So we look on these multiplanary formats for where the fissures are. This is the right oblique fissure, and uh, here it is, and that's the horizontal fissure. This is the left. We also look for bronchiectasis. Patients with bronchiectasis have high risks of complication as well as mild valve migration. They could cough, they 
valves out, and we want to exclude malignancy. We don't want to collapse the lobe because we didn't see it. And also, it's important to check the heart and the pulmonary vasculature to make sure there's no features to suggest pulmonary hypertension that may cause complication in the treatment, or that these are contributing to patient shortness of breath. So when we look at the fissional analysis, we want slice thickness of 1.5 millimeters or less, ideally less, so that we've got quantitative analysis. You can see this is a coronal format. If the slices are too thick, you have blurred lines for your fissures. We use multiplanar reformats to assess for location of defects, but it can be very difficult if there are bully next to the fissure to be certain. So this is a patient who's had previous surgery. You can see some surgical stage rules material here. We've got bully on the left hand side. And as we go backwards through the chest, you can see the fissure is pulled up on this side with the surgical staples here. The left oblique fissure is in a normal place, but it's hard to say does it come to the hilum at that point because of these bully. And as you go posteriorly, it's almost impossible to work out where the fissure is on either side because of the morphology of the lung. So even with computer assessments, this can be challenging. It is difficult with visual assessment. But what we tend to do is try to give a ballpark figure of whether the fissure is not intact, i.e. less than 80% present, 80 to 95% present, therefore intermediate for being intact, or more than 95% present, which is intact. And then that can be translated as well with quantitative analysis on computing. We use the Stratex assessment for Bormonics, but other software packages can do a similar evaluation. And this is the kind of printout that you can get, which shows here on the left, you can see the left of the fissure is intact, and it says it's 100% intact, whereas on the right, you can see there is a defect in the horizontal fissure here, this red area, that shows that this is not completely intact. On the right oblique fissure, there is a small defect, but very, very minimal. Different patient with the same evaluation. The left is again intact, but this time there's a larger defect in the middle, um, between the middle and upper lobes in the horizontal fissure, and also within the oblique fissure. So it's questionable whether any endobronchial valve therapies would make a difference for this patient because of collateral flow through these defects. We can also do quantitative structural analysis to look at how destroyed the lungs are. So the idea is the denser the colour, the more destruction that there is. You can see the base, as we'd expect, is smoking to be spared, whereas the upper lobes are affected. And you can see here the predominance of the uh, destruction in the left lung compared to the right lung is about the same. But the volumes overall can be looked at as well. And if the left upper lobe is larger with an intact fissure, then that would then be targeting the left. It's really difficult to make these decisions without this quantitative analysis if you've not got an expert chest radiologist. We also use ventilation and perfusion scanning for functional evaluation. So this is the AP view. So this is from the front to the back of a perfusion study. You can tell it's that because there's no airway in the centre here. And you can see there were bullous changes here on the medial aspect on the left. And there is a photopenic area here that doesn't uh, show up. And as we move backwards, so this is from the back now, looking forwards, the hearts on the left, you can see there is right apical and left apical bullous disease, and both of the APCs show reduced, uh, increased, and uh, you should have nice white areas like this. So there's reduced, there's photopenia there, which means that it's just not confusing because the lungs are destroyed. But the more modern way of looking at it is with spec scanning. Now, this is a combination of CT and planar perfusion and ventilation imaging. So this is ventilation perfusion, and we can look at it in different views, a bit like a PET CT, and we can therefore see areas where we're not ventilating and we're not perfusing. Interestingly, in this case, from the study in 2015, this is area of perfusion and ventilation. This uh, abnormality is picked up. There's a tumour hanging in there. So obviously we have to be vigilant to look for complications of smoking related diseases. When we're talking about post-treatment problem solving, we've got several times when we do use imaging, we routinely follow up post endobronchial valve patients with x-rays because they're most likely to have a complication of a pneumothorax in the first week. We also look for infective exacerbations, complex or prolonged pneumothoraces following either valve therapy or surgery. 
And also, if they've got worsening symptoms, despite a good radiological response. And then we need CT with one millimetre slices or less. And then the most important thing that I do is to look for the correct positioning of the valves and to see where the valves need to be removed. So here's a case in point where there was initial left upper lobe atelectasis after valve insertion. So much so there has been a pneumothorax that has been managed and the pneumothorax has resolved, but also the left upper lobe collapse has gone. So why would that be if it collapsed and then it came back and reinflated? Well, the reason for that is this valve here, you can see, should be sitting snugly across the airway, but in fact, it's on an angle with this subsegmental airway next to it, which is allowing air to pass round the valve and reinflate the left upper lobe. So CT is essential for looking for these post-procedural issues and problems. So I hope I've given you some idea of all the different things radiology can input into emphysema patients with LVR needs. And if you've got any questions, please do ask them. That was great, Rebecca, thank you. Fantastic overview of imaging in lung volume reduction. Should we move on to the surgical talk now? And we'll take all the all the questions at the end, if that's okay. Hello, hi. I'm going to be talking to you today about lung volume reduction. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on um, on the procedure, and uh, my colleague, um, Mr. Granato, will speak to you a bit more about how this is implemented in our practice here within Manchester. So, um, it's just in terms of COPD. Um, it's estimated that about 1.2 million people are living with and diagnosed with COPD, or about 2% of the whole population, and 4.5% of all people um, over uh, 40, the age of 40. Uh, the number of people who have ever had a diagnosis of COPD has increased by 27% in the last decade. Um, we're finding basically there's more undiagnosed cases being found and the degree is, sorry, the disease is becoming more common. And we're also noticing because of a change in record keeping, uh, we're also able to notice um, more uh, more of these conditions. Uh, the prevalence, as you can see here, it's a little bit old, but you can see that it's increasing uh, gradually over time from 2004 to 2012, and this is data from the British Lung Foundation. Um, and generally speaking, there's about 115,000 people diagnosed, uh, new diagnosis of COPD every year. Uh, it's also a major contributor of mortality. Uh, if you can see, see here from the table, the number of deaths associated with COPD has risen in both the male and female populations from 2011 to 2015. And this is from the Office of National Statistics. In 2015, there are about 15,528 deaths um, related to COPD, and that's for males and for females, there's about 15,330 deaths. Uh, the pathophysiology basically with COPD is you get destruction of your air spaces and that leads to a loss of elastic recoil and a collapse of the small airways. Um, essentially, you develop a hyper, a hyper expansion of the lungs and areas of the lungs which are ventilated but not perfused. And uh, this uh, also can lead to air trapping. The rationale for lung volume reduction is to remove redundant lung and which allows expansion of uh, the functional perfused lung, and which then translates to better ventilation and um, symptomatic benefit. You are aiming to try to normalize your lung volumes uh, on pulmonary function tests, and you get improved chest wall and diaphragmatic function, uh, which then improves your breathing mechanics. So uh, lung volume reduction surgery was first described by Brantigan in 1957. He described it as a bilateral stage thoracotomy. Uh, and had a mortality of about 18%. It kind of just faded out of existence for uh, a few decades until it was revisited by a surgeon in America named Joel Cooper. And in this stage, in this procedure, he did a bilateral stage procedure via median sternotomy. He did this on 20 patients and all had good functional outcome in, in regards to quality of life, pulmonary function uh, tests and freedom of, from oxygen. And there was actually no uh, mortality uh, seen in, in this cohort. Now, we basically had a, a run of, of studies since then, and as you can see, there's quite a, in the limitations area section, there's quite a varying degree of um, heterogeneity in terms of the actual studies. Some had small size, 
some had a high mortality, some had very short duration. So there wasn't really any groundbreaking evidence that would guide clinicians as to whether or not this was a, a valuable procedure um, and until the NET trial was introduced. And this was a prospective randomized multi-center clinical trial. There was about 608 patients in the surgical arm and 610 patients in the medical arm. The inclusion criteria include things like an FEV1 less than 40%, residual volume greater than 150, total lung capacity greater than 100. And within the study, they identified an early high-risk group, and these were people that had FEV1 less than 20 and a DLCO less than 20, or homogenous distribution of the COPD, and they found that there was a 16% 30-day mortality. Uh, the median follow-up of the trial was about 29 months, and the main outcome measures were mortality, exercise capacity, and quality of life. Now, uh, the good candidates that we found were essentially in uh, those with upper lobe emphysema and low exercise capacity. And these people, we found that there was an improved survival, sorry, improvement in survival, functional outcome, and quality of life with a mortality of about 1.5%. In the second group, which were upper lobe emphysema and a high exercise capacity, we didn't see a survival benefit, but we did see improvement in, in functional outcomes and quality of life. And in the third group, which were non-upper lobe emphysema and low exercise capacity, there was only an improved quality of life. Um, the poor candidates were the ones that were previously mentioned, and these are the people you generally don't operate on. Um, you can see from these two graphs, those with a upper lobe uh, predominance uh, indicated by the uh, blue arrow and low baseline exercise capacity at five years had um, uh, uh, a, a lower, uh, sorry, a higher chance of death with medical therapy. Whereas if you compare it with the red arrow, uh, those with non-upper low predominance and a high baseline exercise capacity had a higher risk of, uh, sorry, a higher risk of death of, in terms of surgery compared to medical therapy. This was also studied in terms of long-term results. We can see uh, from the blue arrow after eight years, those with upper lobe um, predominance and low exercise capacity had a higher risk of death um, in the medical arm compared to the surgical arm. Now, investigations that we would typically do include things like a history and physical examination, arterial blood gases, uh, performance examinations like shuttle walk tests, and ECG and an echo to assess the uh, operability of the, the, of the patient. And things we would look for are sort of extensive uh, coronary artery disease, uh, poor ejection fraction, or high pulmonary artery pressures. These are things that you uh, would potentially serve as exclusion criteria. Radiology is performed, which can include the CT scan uh, or different types of perfusion scans, which um, we will discuss a bit further in the radiology talk. Now for the next slide, my colleague, uh, Mr. Granato, will uh, take over from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, VJ, for your kind introduction. My name is Felice Granato, and I'm one of the thoracic surgeons here in Manchester. And together with VJ, uh, we do perform surgery for uh, a VRS. The inclusion criteria uh, for referral to the um, COPD and VT are based on NICE guidelines. Uh, we do want to ha have evidence of symptomatic hyperinflation due to emphysema with impaired quality of life, uh, the latter mainly demonstrated by MRSC, uh, this near scale of three or more our patients uh, need to have stopped smoking for at least four months and having completed a pulmonary rehab program within the last 12 months or participating in a post-PR exercise program, as well as they um, need to have done a six-minute walk test with a distance of more than 140 meters or an incremental shuttle walk test with a distance accomplished greater than 18 meters. We want them to have an FE1 of less than 50% with a, a DSCO greater than 20%, as well as a total lung capacity greater than 55% and a residual volume greater than 150%, with a PACO2 of less than 7 and a body mass index greater than 18. Um, once uh, the inclusion criteria for MDD discussion are met, we select patients for LVRS when they have hydrogenous emphysema, mostly upper lobe predominant, sometimes uh, lower lobe predominant as well, in presence of collateral ventilation that makes this patient not suitable for uh, endobronchial treatment. Uh, we 
clearly do not operate on patients who are uh, to a high risk because of low DS0 and FE1, which we consider at a level below 20% as a greater risk, uh, particularly when this is associated with poor nutritional status. We clearly do not operate when there is not a suitable target and when there is co-existing uh, lung comorbidity, in particular interstitial lung disease. From a surgical perspective, the procedure is conducted with single lung ventilation. Pain control is achieved with uh, intercostal net block, which is done under direct vision at time of BATS. Vision is positioned in a lateral decubitus, and the BATS approach generally is made with two or three ports. The bit of the lung that we resect is removed with reinforced stapler, uh, has a boomerang shape, and has a volume of around about 30 percent of the lobe with land anatomical landmarks represented by the exaggerous vein on the right and the aortic arch on the left. The volume that we remove is around about 70 to 90 grams and we're currently developing a protocol to establish the appropriate amount of lung to be removed uh, at the time of the operation based on preoperative lung function test and residual volume which we'll talk a little bit uh, more in details later. We generally one drain and that drain is left off suction with x-ray performed immediately after surgery. Uh, the drain is kept off suction if the lung is expanded, the do suction is the lung is, if the lung is not expanded. Uh, we can see in uh, this slide uh, a kind of summary of the BATS approach for LVRS with two or three ports uh, triangulation a V, uh, sorry, a boomerang shaped resection of the target area, a manipulation of the lung with um, for, forester forceps. Clearly the area that is manipulated with forester is included within the resection margin to make sure that uh, uh, the air leak is minimized. We clearly do not um, do many stenotomies for LVRS, uh, uh, although this allows a bilateral approach, we believe that the, uh, the invasivity and the morbidity of such a procedure is uh, not beneficial for our patients. Um, we mostly prefer a uh, BATS bilateral approach with two-stage um, intent, and this is based on uh, Mr. Waller paper published in 2010, where we see that clearly um, patients who receive unilateral LVRS tend to decline after initial gain at four to six years after surgery, whilst this decline is less evident in those cohort, in, in, in those patients who receive a bilateral LVRS with one or two stage approach. In, for the two stage approach, the advantage is, rep advantage is represented by the uh, possibility of not operating on those patients who do not decline after the first operation and also reducing the uh, impact and the morbidity of uh, uh, the procedure which allows a better uh, selection uh, of our patients and a possibility to uh, use a ward as a, a post-operative destination. As I mentioned before, uh, the GNI use uh, adjunct uh, and sealants during the operation. Uh, we do use reinforced staplers all the time. We generally use, generally use um, tissue patch on the raw surface of the lung, and uh, we apply sometimes a glue, mainly TCO, on the staple line or on the raw surface of the lung, as described before. As the operation has as aim to reduce the space within and the, and the cavity within the, plural, um, within the affected pleura, we sometimes perform a pleural tent, uh, and that is mostly used when we predict uh, a significant air leak postoperatively. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, we use drain off suction with an immediate X-ray showing lung expansion. If that is achieved, drain, drain remains on suction. And as I mentioned before, if the lung is down, we put, then put it on suction. We do post-op uh, physio in, in uh, a um, aggressive fashion. And we'll look at the complication in a minute when we will look at our activity over the course of the last seven years. Um, we want to see a reduction in the residual volume and uh, a, an improvement in the FE1 and the PLC. 
uh, improvement of F150% uh, in six months and 35% at 12 months. We want to see our patients having a better performance status and a better MRSC after surgery with a better six minute walk distance. Uh, as we said before, they have prehab prior to surgery, but we uh, um, want them to have prehab uh, after surgery as well. We want to see the elevation of the diaphragm on the side of surgery. And as I said before, we do not, um, we sometimes don't do a um, uh, double procedure when patients uh, have significant and lasting benefit from the first operation. Um, with regard to our activity, we reviewed it from 2012 to 2019. Uh, we looked at the in-hospital mortality as well as length of stay and overall survival. We had 58 patients which were evenly divided into the LVRS group and the EBVI group with a mean age of around 60 years and the predominance of males. Uh, almost 80% of our patients were then, uh, who underwent a VRS were done with minimally invasive techniques and uh, more than 70% of them had a sublobal resection instead of a anatomical lung resection. Uh, the number of valves inserted for the EBVI patient group was uh, mean of three with a standard deviation of, deviation of two. Outcomes were very good because the hospital mortality for our surgical patient was 0%. Only one patient died after valves. Um, and the length of stay was higher as expected for the surgical group uh, with a significant difference of two days. And that's probably mostly related to the presence of post-operative leak in uh, um, longer than seven days in 15% uh, of our patients uh, after surgery. Uh, the follow-up, as I mentioned before, is very long and was median of 29 months. That showed no difference in terms of survival between the uh, two groups, valves versus surgery. Uh, in conclusion, this small but uh, long um, um, uh, follow-up study shows that uh, uh, both techniques are safe, they have very good outcomes, uh, and clearly this could be better evaluated than this under current um, uh, investigation with the use of not only pre but also post-operative respiratory function and quality of life markers. Um, this study uh, shows what Vijay and I have been talking in this presentation uh, before, that uh, a key to success for lung volume reduction surgery and, and the bronchial valve treatment is based on a multidisciplinary team approach with appropriate MDD discussion and selection, um, as well as uh, well-instituted protocols to perform surgery and look after patients afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, please ask questions if needed, and that's Vijay again. Thanks. BJ and Felice, an excellent presentation with a nice overview of our, our experience here over the last few years. Our final presentation is about the most important person in, in all of this process, which is the patient. So we're, we're going to hear from a patient who's been treated with endobronchial valves, and she will tell us a little bit about her experience. My name's Patricia, Patricia Williams. I'm 64. COPD since around 2007, maybe a little earlier. And I was always at the doctors, chest infections, taking antibiotics regularly, very regularly, and steroids. It, it, it was just a continuous thing to help me to breathe and to just try and do everyday life things. Can you give us examples of daily activities that you found hard? getting upstairs, exercising, walking, sometimes even talking, uh, to keep breathing and stopping and breathing and even eating, everything, everything I, I wanted to do, I couldn't. And how did that affect your interactions with your loved ones in your family? It affected me deeply. I got very depressed about it. Um, I was really stressed because I couldn't go anywhere. It was difficult for me to get on a bus, and it's a bus normally a five-minute walk from where I am, but it would take me about half an hour to get there, maybe longer. And I just didn't see the point in trying to because it was just too much. And was there a track record of you going into hospital as an emergency, or was that something that you didn't suffer with? I did go into hospital a couple of times. The last time I was in hospital over there, I was really bad. I mean, I actually collapsed at home. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, I was gasping. Um, got the ambulance and it took quite a while to get me settled and sorted out. And I still felt 
I can't, it was very overwhelming, very distressing. Sure. It just put a lot of strain on me. What inhalers or pills and potions did you take at the time? I was taking salbutamol, carbocysteine, Montelukast, Acrete. And did you have a nebulizer? I did. I have an, a nebulizer that I use four times a day, sometimes five or six at the time. I see. But it, but it was such a lot to take, so I just had to take my time doing it. Your own hospital specialist referred you to the emphysema service at Withinshaw in our centre in late yes. 2018, early 2019. Um, do you remember what prompted that referral? Did you instigate it or was it something that they proposed? Well, because it had been got under them for so long, there was nothing more that they said they could do for me. Mm -hmm. At that point, that was their final um, words were, I'm going to have to refer you because there's nothing more I can do. Okay. So they referred me to within your hospital. Yeah. Do you remember <clears throat> the approach I took with you at the time when we first met about the two treatment options that I was being yes. asked to consider for you? And I mentioned two treatments. Um, one of them was the valves and the other one was the transplants. Yeah, lung transplant. There was somewhere we didn't want to go, definitely. And then you were talking about the vowels and you discussed them both with me and very clearly. I, so I've discussed, obviously, the pros and the cons of the two approaches. Do you remember why we thought that a transplant might have been something that we should try and avoid if possible? It was me age, I think, as well. Um, it was quite a big operation. There was a chance that having, having that done under my condition, I might not have come through it. Yeah. So do you think now in hindsight that the decision to pursue the route of lung volume reduction, downsizing the lungs with the valves, was the right one? Definitely. Okay. I had the uh, operation in June 2019. I don't know what, what I was going to expect, I'll be honest, but when I woke up the next morning, oh my God, amazing. I was, it, was, it was painless. It was marvellous. I couldn't believe. In fact, I'm like, wow, what's going on? I've been reborn. Good. How long did you stay in hospital after the procedure? I don't think it was that long. A couple of days, maybe? A couple of days. And when you went home, how did you feel? Fantastic. Okay. Absolutely fantastic. It was amazed how quickly it, it helped works. Even yeah. just getting up and moving about, there was a lot, a lot of changes. Can you share these changes with us? What sort of things could you do that you couldn't do before? I couldn't walk very far. I couldn't walk 10 metres. I can achieve that. Um, I couldn't do any gardening, whereas now I've been in the garden doing weeding. Um, I've been... Hoovering, able to hoover in the house. I do get up the stairs, although I know I struggle sometimes a little bit on the stairs, but I can get up there. I couldn't before. I was actually sleeping downstairs. It's really comforting to hear, actually, Patricia. And um, it's it's nice to hear you say that there has been a positive impact on your life from that. Absolutely. Region. Have you had any complications since, for example? Have you had to go into hospital since we've done the procedure? I've not had to go in hospital. I've not had any more steroids since I've had it done. Fantastic. I've had the occasional uh, bit of a chest infection, but I think that was due to the weather, the winter. Uh, once, I think it was. Fabulous. But, um, it's mar I mean, I was living on antibiotics and steroids before, but afterwards, completely different again. And how does the family... Um, feel about your condition now? Oh, they're a bit amazed. They can't believe the difference, the change. What I, I could talk now. I couldn't talk in a conversation without trying to catch my breath, and I just stopped doing it. But now I'm like a chatterbox, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really good to hear. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, if you had a message to share with patients who have a similar condition to yours, who have reached the stage where medical treatment 
has reached its limits. Um, what would you say to them and to their own doctors about the service that you've received? What advice would you give them? The service I received was magical. And I think anyone that's going through anything similar to what I've had done, either that it's a bit less or a bit more, they need to just go for it and they'll find out the difference right away. Would you say that they ought to um, approach their own doctors about being referred to a similar service in the country? Definitely. They definitely need... If there's nowhere else that they can... Once the treatment's finished and you can't do anything else, then that's got to be the answer. Well, I think that was really, really good. I'm grateful for your time. Uh, I think it's a very positive statement. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. I'm only going to take two or three minutes at the tail end of the meeting just to share the physiology and radiology of um, Patricia's case. Uh, she's certainly one of our shining stars, and I hope you've enjoyed her narrative um, of her experience of the service so far. So um, she was referred to us at the back end of 2018, and you will see immediately, I'm sorry, it's a busy slide, but just the salient points are right at the top, her FEV1 is around 670 milliliters, which is 30% predicted. So she had severe airflow obstruction. Um, and with that, she had a mild degree of airflow limitation because, sorry, of uh, hyperinflation, because her RV was only around 130% of the predicted. If you cast your eyes down into that screen, you'll find that gas diffusion was moderately reduced and 66% predicted, but it didn't translate into respiratory failure. She's well saturated, well oxygenated at rest. Uh, and when she did a shuttle walk test, um, she covered 220 meters with a mild degree of desaturation. So the summary of this is severe airflow limitation, relatively preserved gas exchange, and a mild to moderate degree of hyperinflation only. And because she is 62, a double lung transplant carries a mortality of around 10 to 15%. And in the absence of um, adverse prognostic features such as hypoxia, hypercapnia, requirement for an IV and pulmonary hypertension, really transplantation would not offer any survival advantage. It'd be purely for quality of life. And when you compare, therefore, the potential for improvement in lung function, dyspnea, and quality of life with lung volume reduction, it's almost on par with transplantation in this scenario. So she opted for the less invasive approach. So very quickly through radiology, this is her baseline chest X-ray, hyperinflated lungs with slightly depressed diaphragms. Makes way for the upper lobes, consistent with centrilobular emphysema on the CT sections. And on the coronal reconstructs, you can perhaps work out that this is heterogeneous uh, disease. It is upper lobe predominant. You can see the difference in the attenuation of the upper lobes and the lower lobes. And using the CT um, assessment, Rebecca concluded that the oblique fissures were intact bilaterally, whereas the, the right horizontal fissure was deficient. So in other words, the ideal target here would be the left upper lobe. So she had um, four valves inserted in the left upper lobe and compare and contrast uh, the pre on the left and the immediate post-operative uh, on the right. And you'll see that there is a pattern of complete left upper lobe atelectasis. The uh, hilum is pulled upwards and indeed the diaphragm is now tinted upwards to reflect the lung volume reduction. This is 48 hours after the procedure and prior to discharge, and you can see um, what I just described. If you keep that in your mind and then move forward in time, you'll find that the pattern is preserved at six weeks, six months, 12 months, and indeed 18 months. So lung volume reduction, atelectasis of the left upper lobe, elevation of the left hemidiaphragm with um, uh, intact positioning of the four valves that we used. In physiological terms, again, sorry, this is the last slide, you'll find that we have a lot of data here, but um, some of the animation disappeared. If you could follow FEV1 preoperatively, it was 670 milliliters, and about six weeks postoperatively, it was up at 840, that's 25% improvement. And if you fast forward a further year to the March of 2020, it was further up to 910 mils, so that's 35% improvement in FEV1 over a period of around 15 to 18 months postoperatively. 
And if you cast your eyes down to long volumes using the body box plethysmography there, get the residual volume. It started, it came down in steps to 2.9 liter, and that's a 20% reduction. So inserting the valves improved FEV1, reduced the RV, and as my colleagues explained, this improved her respiratory mechanics. But the key thing really is if you move your eyes now to the diagrams on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll find that the improvements in lung function was sustained for the whole period of 18 months, perhaps even gradually improved. And this translated into a further increment in her walking distance on a shuttle test from 220 pre trans uh, sorry, to 270 meters um, at the last time of testing with a slightly reduced um, desaturation during that exercise. And as, as you um, all appreciate, there is very little pharmacotherapy out there that can rival this outcome. And I know that this is a unique case and that's why we're presenting it in the sense that it sort of stretches the improvement in respiratory mechanics and how it translates into improved breathlessness, exercise tolerance, quality of life, and indeed objective measures of walking distance in this case. Thanks, Mo. So that concludes our talks. So I hope people have had a chance to put questions onto the, onto the internet there. We, we've got a list here, we've picked some out. What is the best way to refer a patient with severe emphysema for lung transplant stroke lung volume reduction? Referral to emphysema service or by filling the referral for lung transplant. If you have the time and you're willing to fill the transplant referral for former, that would be ideal because it is quite comprehensive. Um, whenever we see a patient with emphysema for transplant, the first thing we ask is, can we get away with that transplantation? So don't think that you have to do a separate referral for lung volume reduction. Maybe this is actually an opportunity for me and Richard to join forces and unify the referral pathways. Yeah. Um, but if you refer to Richard and or me for lung volume reduction and the MDT concludes that transplant is the better option, and then my presence in the MDT will allow for a seamless transition into transplantation. You don't have to duplicate the work. And vice versa, if I feel somebody came to transplant is more suited for in the bronchial valve or other modalities of lung volume reduction, then I'll bring them into the emphysema MDT. Um, and, and that's the beauty of the model that we have. I think it's unique to Manchester compared with the other services uh, in the country. So next question, six minute walk test or shuttle walk? Don't have a preference. Um, difficulty doing these in the COVID era, is this necessary for referral? Gosh, it's, it's a nice objective measure for us to do pre and post treatment to, to show evidence of improvement. I accept it can be difficult to do these tests, particularly um, a shuttle test, but they're often done in, in the corridor in the hospital, aren't they? And, you know, it, it's not great mixing with other patients and mixing with the public. It, it's not essential. We're, we're in unusual times and, you know, we will try to accommodate referrals as best we can. I think ideally we would like some measure of baseline lung function. I think I mentioned before that there's a minimum walking distance that we like patients to have. And that's because if patients can't walk very far and haven't walked very far for a long time, then they, they lose all their muscle mass, they become deconditioned. And in that situation, a rehab program will be much more effective for them than anything that we can achieve by lung volume reduction. We may improve the mechanics of their breathing, but actually they're not going to walk any further if, if their muscles are wasted away and, and very weak. Was the case presented, discussed at the LVRS MDT? Was surgical LVRS offered in addition to transplant? Yeah, I can answer that one. So, so yes, every case we've taken really to in the bronchial valve therapy has been thoroughly discussed in the MDT and all the options put through to the patients. Um, in, in the case of Patricia, she would not have really objected to surgery if it were the only option, but she was keen to avoid more drastic approaches. And obviously the risk of complications with surgical lung volume reduction are significantly higher. Um, and, and that's why um, it, she opted for the endobronchial valve therapy. Would a patient with well-controlled respiratory failure, i.e. a PCO2 less than seven on home NIV be considered if they meet the other referral criteria? Yes, that's, that's a simple one to answer. Yes, they would. I think we're quite lucky here in, in that we have the support of the long-term ventilation team as well. You know, the, the issues would be around 
um, managing the post bronchoscopy. I say yes, actually, um, whether they'd be accepted for surgery, I think is a different matter, but certainly we would consider taking them on for endobronchial valve treatment under conscious sedation. You know, we, we can do this with really very minimal amounts of, of sedation. So there is another question, which is, I think, straightforward. What if the patients are too well for valve treatment? I suppose if they're too well for, think of us as the advanced emphysema treatment team. It's when you feel you've exhausted medical therapy and pulmonary rehabilitation, and yet the patient remains incapacitated and their quality of life is significantly impaired. If, if they're too well, then clearly we don't need to see them. Uh, it's a judgment call that you make in partnership with your patient but we are more than happy to see um, any referral that you send out our way. I think I'd add to that and say, you know, it's a question, how do you define what's too well? It's a question of their symptom burden, isn't it? And a little bit about the exercise tolerance. So if you look at the trials using endobronchial valves, the improvement in, in exercise capacity in terms of six minute walk test ranges between 40 and 80 meters on average. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's already able to walk a mile, then us giving them an extra 80 meters probably isn't going to make a difference. However, if they're only walking one, 200 yards, then you know the, the benefits are really quite significant. So it, it is an individual assessment, an individual decision. And certainly we've had patients referred to us that we felt perhaps were too good to be treated at the time. And then we've kept them under review. And I can think of at least one or two that have deteriorated over the course of the next six to 12 months and then gone on to have treatment. Um, another point there is that the walking uh, or the exercise tolerance, as reported by the patient, is very much a subjective thing, which is completely different to the objective yeah. assessment. You heard Pat say that she could work, barely walk 10 meters before the procedure, but her pre-treatment objective assessment revealed the 220 meter on an incremental sheltered walk test. And actually that comforts me because it says that she has a lot of post-operative rehab potential. It means when we treat her and if she engages with exercise, she'll do well. But she says she could only walk 10 meters, yet when you put them through the test, they can cover 200 meters, mm. some. So again, it's dialogue. And if we see patients and we don't feel that they're ready for treatment, some opt to be discharged back to your care. Others prefer to remain under observation under our care. It's a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. There's a question. How would you like us to refer a patient? Is there a point of access? So at the moment, it, it's simply a letter to, to myself and Mo send the letter in addressed to either of us or addressed to the emphysema service um, include as much information as you can so in terms of referral criteria i mentioned the criteria that nhs england have suggested for that should be met to generate a discussion in the mbt so essentially the patients need to have emphysema they need to have hyperinflation and they need to be breathless mm. um, we're very happy to review cases in the mbt before we bring them up to clinic or before we contact them and, you know, the, the quality of that discussion really depends on how much information you're able to put into the referral letter. I see Becca's got her hand up. Um, uh, also, I would say if you've already got imaging available, if we can try to get that across. Um, again, if you've not got a CT done, um, we can try and get the right kind of CT done and get that imported when we actually get to review the patient. We'll be able to give you a quicker answer than if we then have to wait to repeat imaging because what we've got isn't up to date or of the right kind of scan. So um, I did mention in the chat if anybody's got a radiology colleague who is not sure what kind of protocol we need to be doing for these patients um, then I'm very happy for them to contact me. I know a lot of chest radiologists in the region I'll be very happy to discuss things through with them. Okay, there's a, a stream of questions, some are quick. I missed the residual volume in the presented case. We'd be grateful if mentioned. So the case we presented had an RV of about 190% of the predicted uh, with a 20% reduction in RV from baseline after treatment. The question, do you always see all patients referred or do you reject after MDT if no major options available? Some of our patients struggle for travel, especially if no major treatment option available. Yeah, well, in some we will reject following the MDT. Certainly these days with doing more and more telephone and remote virtual clinics, you know, we're, we're able to do an assessment. If there isn't enough information in the referral letter, then it may be that just a telephone call initially would be enough for us to say whether they're likely to be suitable. And then we'd only bring them forwards up and up to clinic for further investigations if we felt there was a good chance we could offer them treatment. 
How long do you follow up patients after LBRS and do you routinely assess BFPs post LBRS? How often, if you do? It's a very good question. We don't have a established follow up protocol uh, following LBRS. Um, I don't know whether you do for valves, but we don't. Uh, but that's what we're looking at just now. So the, the first step will be uh, to, um, you know, uh, see what the differences are on our historical cohort by um, retesting all of the patients we have operated that put valves on. Um, and then uh, on the basis of that, we would like to formulate some, some form of established protocol for following them up and uh, with the correct investigation, which certainly will be lung function test. Um, so short answer is no, but we are at this work in progress to make it happen. After valve treatment, we will follow up all the patients at or around six weeks. And the, you know the, those that haven't had a benefit by that time, either symptomatically or physiologically, will then go on and have a CT scan as, as Rebecca alluded to before. So certainly we see everybody at six weeks. We would then follow them up six weeks following that. And the length of follow-up thereafter depends on their symptomatic response. It depends on the individual patient wishes. It depends where they live as well. You, you know, we treat patients from across the region, up as far north as, as Lancaster and Morecambe. And clearly we're not going to keep them under long-term review if we're not going to offer anything else. Some patients want treatment on, in the other lung. We, you know, we only ever treat one lung at a time. The um, practical questions Two, two questions. First of all is, what about homogeneity within the bronchial valves? If you do want to take that. So there is evidence of benefit um, in homogeneous emphysema. It just depends whether you can identify a target lobe or not. The benefits are not as great as you see in heterogeneous emphysema. So with, you know, in terms of lung function, heterogeneous emphysema, you may see an improvement in FEV1 of 20, 22%. It's more like 12 to 15% with homogeneous emphysema. It's interesting that the NHS England criteria talks specifically about heterogeneous emphysema um, and not homogeneous emphysema. Uh, you know, homogeneous emphysema is difficult to define. If you look at the trials, they did trials specifically looking at homogeneous emphysema, but there's actually quite a lot of overlap if you look at the inclusion criteria and the definition of homogeneous versus heterogeneous. So I, I wouldn't get too hung up on it actually. And, you know, if you have a patient you think might be suitable, refer them in and we, we would have a look in, in the MDT. I think ultimately it will come down to the decision of the MDT as to whether we call them truly homogenous, which actually I think is fairly rare. One of the uh, questions that come through is, um, is having LVRS or EBV a contraindication for lung transplant in the future? And the short answer is no. Um, on the contrary, we believe that the treatment is a continuum and lung volume reduction, whether it's surgical or through endobronchial techniques, can be seen as a bridge to future transplantation. We recognize that the median survival fo following lung transplantation is small. It's in the region of about six years, give or take. So if you're looking particularly at a young patient, say in their 40s or 50s with early onset emphysema, it is in their interest to defer the need for lung transplantation if at all possible. And if lung volume reduction which whichever, with whatever technique you choose, delays that by two, three or four years, then it's well worth the endeavor. As long as they are at the time of needing a transplant fit for the surgery, the pre-procedure intervention will not rule them out. How strict are you regarding smoking for EBV and LVRS? Do you use urinary coating in like, the, like I apply in transplant? or is the patient's word good enough? We take the patient's word. Yeah. We don't test, we take the patient's word. I suppose you can see that um, it, it is a, uh, a journey, and of course, lung volume reduction is part of it, and it's not without its cost and risks, but it's not as big an undertaking to uh, as transplantation, but also because of the duty that we hold to the relatives of the donor and the rest of the patients on the waiting list, we have to be seen to be exhausting all that we have at our disposal to handpick individuals who truly committed to a change in their lifestyle, not to deserve, I would I shy away from that sort of term, but to earn that second chance. You need to show a true commitment. And Bash and some of the others will be aware that in the cohort that we receive with past smoking lung disease for lung transplantation, 
25 to 35 percent of patients who swear blindly that they have quit smoking have urine that is teeming with cotinin, consistent with either active nicotine consumption over fashion or still smoking. We don't use that to penalize them, but we use them to engage them in the process of change of lifestyle and truly commit to the change that is required for a good outcome post lung transplantation. The requirements are less strict when it comes to lung volume reduction because it's a, a lesser invasive and a less taxing intervention. Is bronchiectasis an absolute contraindication? No, it's not an absolute contraindication. Um, I don't think we would treat a lobe that was bronchiectatic, but if there's bronchiectasis in a non-target lobe and the exacerbation rate's controlled and, and, and sputum load isn't massive, then we would consider it. I think the only caveat I would put to that statement is that if the if the airways are colonized by a chronic infection, so there is positive sputum microbiology or bowel samples from the time of doing the chart test, we'd probably consider that in our MDT yeah. as a potential contraindication. Yeah. And thank you very much for, for spending the evening with us. It's it's very much appreciated. I hope that was yeah. helpful.